Hello, you're back with uh, Mike Mason of Curzium and... And I'm Paul Fricker. Hi there. Paul, so um, we... Um, so I'm of Curzium. So why, why, why am I talking to you? I have no idea. Uh, so uh, Mike and I worked together on the seventh edition Call of Cthulhu rules and uh, have worked on numerous other projects, scenarios and campaigns together as well. Indeed. So uh, today uh, we're going to talk a little bit about how we prepare to run a scenario. Um, so let's get into it. So Paul, what do you do? Well, are we talking about working up our own scenario or one a published one? Well, let's let's start with uh, say a published one. What you know, what what what? That's probably the easy one to start with. Yeah. Okay. So I um obviously read through it, right? So read it from start to end, and take some notes. Strip it down to some notes that you kind of get. I I I go through it and I chop out some bits. But once I've read it, I've got uh, an idea of it all in my head and my notes, you know, make sense to me. If I just gave those notes to somebody else, they'd make no sense at all. But <laughs> those notes make sense because I've made them relatively recently to when I run the scenario and I can use those as a framework for running it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that is essentially what I would do in a nutshell. So when you say notes, do you... Um... That's a you know you get a notebook out and you literally kind of make a few bullet points per the characters, the the likely order of scenes or locations, that kind of thing. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I'd break it down into so I want to know what the opening scene is, and I want to know what the player characters are. So what the investigators are? Are we making our own investigators? Are there pregens? If we're making our own investigators, I want some ideas for what they might be. I can throw it out to the players. Is it really open or is it, you know, that they're all members of the Miskatonic University um, university crew or something like that? So have they got a team? Or can I give them a, an idea for an investigator organisation that they might belong to? So that's the first step. But in terms of, or maybe they've already got characters and we're bringing them into this game. So if they were using existing characters, I want to think, well, how could those investigators come into this game? And I feel that's partly on me, but also partly on them. So in the first uh, session at the start of the game, I would look for a premise of the scenario that I can put to them. So I don't want to give too much away, but if it's uh, an expedition out into Lovecraft country, into the rural area, I might sort of say, you know, in this game we're going to be going off into the countryside. You know, somebody's going to get a call from a relative. Uh, or you're going to read something in a newspaper that takes you out there. Why might you guys get involved? So it's either I put it to them or, you know, I come up with an obvious reason why they'd be engaged. Yeah, it makes sense. I'm just going to take a step back and just talk about some of the uh, nuts and bolts in terms of you, you mentioned using a notebook. I mean, I sometimes do that. Um, more often than not, I just get a pencil. And if it's a you know, a published scenario, um, I either print it out or I've got the book. And I uh, and I just, you know, go down the side of uh, paragraphs and just kind of put a little star saying, this is an important bit. This, this is something I need to, you know, do in the scenario or be aware of. And then sometimes if there's extraneous material, that's kind of you know, useful for me as a keeper, but actually not going to be used in the actual game. So maybe a lot of the background sort of stuff to just kind of, you know, I've already, I'm already aware of that. I don't need that when I'm playing the scenario. I might just underline a couple of bits, just to remind me of a person's name or whatever, and then actually just put a line through it. So visually, as I go through the scenario, I know I can ignore that bit because I already know it. Um, and all the bits with stars are kind of, you know, are, are the bits I'm really concentrating on. And they're, and they're acting as aid memoirs because, I've, as you say, I've already read the scenario maybe once or twice. I kind of know what's going on. But in the middle of the game, they're good bits. They're, they're, they may be... Um, there may be clues I'm highlighting or player handout. So don't forget that actually at this point, they may find this player handout or clue, um, that kind of thing. Uh, and because, um, you know, I, I just find that an easier for me rather than necessarily having a, a separate bunch of notes. Um, and, you know, if I was using a PDF, I guess what I'd use is the, um, the highlighter tool to do exactly the same thing of the text, you know, because I know, you know, some people run from PDFs. I don't tend to, but, um, but you know that's a that's a modern thing, isn't it, for people? So, <laughs> <laughs> well, I think any of those things 
different people take notes in different ways. So, you know, any of those things, either highlighting the text in the book, underlining it, whatever, doing that on a PDF, or, I, you know, I would favor like just having some blank sheets of paper and just writing some notes for myself. Uh, and, you know, if so what I used to do a long time ago, I can remember taking copious notes. So if there was a description of some NPC, I would pretty much write the description out and write down everything about them. It was quite hard to use in the game, though, because I can't read all that at speed in the game. If I've just written it that day or, you know, recently, I can kind of remember it. So that's fine. But all I find I really need is a, a couple of words just to put me in the right frame of mind about that NPC. So if they're described in the book as wearing a dark suit and a bow tie and a bowler hat and a, I don't know, got glasses and a beard. Is that stuff really important? I've kind of got a mental image of the guy. And if I describe them, you know, without a hat and no beard and, you know, no glasses, but a monocle, is that really going to change things that much as long as I'm consistent? So if I've put down maybe like a little doodle of the person, a little sketch or a photograph or just a a few words about them enough to remind me what they're like or even a person's name that I know you know they're a bit like Bob okay great I kind of know what Bob looks like I'll just describe it like that so it's kind of finding shorthand ways to put that information down because it doesn't have to be exactly the same as what was in the scenario because some of it is just uh, description and color and you can change that a bit that's fine yeah, I think I think you know using um, you know most scenarios have you know photographs or artwork of the different kind of NPCs, and if they don't, it's very easy to go online and you know grab, grab something that you think is appropriate for that kind of person, and and you can either use them as play aids with the players themselves, or certainly as keeper, you can just you know just print out on a page a bunch of them with their names underneath, and and so you don't need any written words necessarily. You just go, oh, you you just describe what's in front of you as a picture. Um, you know, those kind of little aids can can be a big help in that way. I think in terms of prep, you've just highlighted something really important. Is using that artwork, the maps, the handouts, all that stuff that comes with a published scenario, print those out so that you can just give them out at the table because it seems obvious, but, you know, that is a, a really important thing to do because that will just help you so much. And if you're going to have a, if they're going into a house, where there's a floor plan, <clears throat> either have a, a whiteboard or a piece of paper or something that you can sketch the map on as they go, or have a printout of the map that you can give them, obviously without the important information on it. <laughs> so, you know, hopefully there's one of those in the book or you can, you know, edit it or you can create one yourself because that is useful in the game, I find, um, for keeping track of where people are and so on. Yeah. No, I mean, I, what I tend to do is um, if, you know, that they're entering the, the, you know, the old house and um, I know I've got a I've got a floor plan of the house and I've actually got a player version with, you know, with just the rooms on and no other information. But I won't give them necessarily that straight away. What I tend to do is, you know, I describe the house, maybe describe the first few rooms so they get the kind of a sense of the lay of the land. But it still allows the players to kind of build some kind of imagination about how the how the house appears to them through my description because obviously their imagination is always going to be better than my description. Um, so once they've got the kind of the layer, the land, or the kind of the rough outline of the house, without having to go around everywhere, you know, that's at that point kind of in the middle of that process. I'll then say, well, you know, here, now you've got an idea of you know where the kitchen and the lounge is. Here's here's the floor plan, and so we, you know, that, that immediately allows me not have to worry about filling out all the details of oh, there's a cupboard on the left, and there's another room here, and you know, you just you give them a kind of a good overview and the description and then then bring out the hand out. I find that, you know, kind of it's a kind of bit of a best best of both worlds, you know, in that way. Yeah, that sounds good to me. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so. No, go ahead. No, I was, I was going to say, so is there anything else in terms of published notes or should we sort of talk about things, you know, things you're creating yourself? Um. I think to have thought through it as well. So you've made some notes and then just think through how they might, how the player characters might go through this scenario. 
you know, you're reading it. Sometimes it's presented as a story. Sometimes it's presented as a series of scenes. Uh, sometimes it's fairly loose. Sometimes it's very um, almost, you know, scene, then scene, then scene, then scene. So think about, you know, if you were a player character or what your player character, what your players might do in the game, how they might react to certain things. If there's a bit where there's choices to be made, consider the choices they might take and consider some of the things you might do in reaction to their um, courses of action. Uh, consider points where you could put something in that is going to steer them in the right direction or bring the game back on track. Because sometimes there are bits where... Um, you know, players might get a bit lost on what to do, for example. And just, con you know, hopefully not, but just consider uh, any, I don't know how to frame it really, how any kind of what you feel might be weak points in the in the story. I mean, yeah, I mean, every player group is different. And, and you know, whilst, you know, most scenarios try and take the kind of, you know, the average version, as in that most players will generally you know, go from A to B to C in this in this particular scenario. Um, obviously, that doesn't always happen, and players do different things and or uh, focus and obsess about you know things that you know aren't that important or or uh, you know jump scenes or, or whatever, and that's all fine. You know, um, but you've got to, as you say, you've got to roll with it. So, kind of being aware of your group, thinking about the players that you have and the kind of things that are likely to do uh, helps you to kind of you know pre-plot that a little bit by by kind of thinking well okay if they do go off track here there's a potential that you know they may go off track and decide to drive to somewhere outside of the scenario what could i do to kind of you know turn them around or, or get them thinking about you know get them thinking about the plot of the scenario again thinking about a few little kind of tools to do that with and that could be simply having an npc arrive at an opportune moment you're just as about to get in the car and they're going off on this red herring um having a, an npc arrive or call them or do something that kind of basically distracts them into back into the plot mm -hmm. uh can be quite useful that kind of thing um you know and the, you know, it could even just be the newspapers arrived and oh crikey oh this has happened oh this is more important than driving off to this other place we go and do this now so it's helping to kind of redirect the player's focus. Um, instances of that can be useful. And I think look at the scenario that you've got in front of you, the published scenario. The published scenario is going to be, unless it's got pre-generated investigators, is going to be a separate thing to your player's investigators. And maybe look through that scenario and think, are there little things that we can use to kind of link the two together? So if there's an NPC in the scenario, that is, well, maybe friendly, but I guess even maybe not. Is there somebody that your investigators already know from a previous game? You know, could you replace that person in the scenario with that one that they already know? Or that town where the scenario is set, could that be, you know, could you transplant that to somewhere where your investigators are already if you've played with them previously? So are there ways of kind of hooking them in to make the players care more about what's going on? I think that's a that's a key thing, because if the players don't really seem interested, if they if there's nothing to hook into, if they're asking themselves, well, why are we going off to this place to do this thing? Then that can cause disengagement. So you really want to try and look for things that will hook them in, if possible. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't have to just be kind of NPCs that have met in previous uh, adventures it could be old player characters mm. that have you know that, that, that you know that, that they you know they retired or they got injured or whatever and actually you know reusing those you know a little bit of surprise really kind of helps to kind of oh crikey I, I'm, I'm my my old character is calling me to do something yeah which, you know, immediately kind of grabs their interest sometimes so or if they found a tome in the last adventure and we've sort of said, you know, well, it's just a book and there's a couple of spells in it or whatever. And, you know, you've, you've read it. And then you come to a new adventure. Well, maybe some of the information for the new adventure, maybe that is in, you can make it like it is in that previous time that you read. Well, you know, that book you read, it actually mentions this place. Oh, OK. Yeah. This way of kind of maybe giving them one of those handouts by saying, well, actually, that was in that information was in this old book you found last time. Yeah. 
and doesn't have to tell them a lot, but it's just enough of a hook to say, oh, this is more than just something you made up. There's a there's a connection to the old scenario, and it suddenly fires their imagination and can work, you know, can work really effectively. Absolutely. Okay. Well, that's probably all we can say on this for the moment. But uh, sounds like something we can talk about again sometime. But uh, for now, thanks for watching. Thank you very much.